real privilege being here today. Um, and I, I appreciate all of you uh, for me being here, and particularly uh, Louise and uh, Ellen and Karen. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I should also mention that, that I'm uh, grateful for the Southern hospitality that Nelson and uh, Adriana have uh, offered all of us. Um, I'm particularly uh, flattered by that that I received and uh, express my, my good fortune of working with Dr. Mary Lee Vance for the uh, patients with Cushing's disease and other patients with pituitary tumors. You know, I, I've added a few slides here based on some of our conversations at dinner last night. We, one of the things we were talking about uh, was how long uh, the delay was in reaching the diagnosis in patients with Cushing's disease. Well, you know, that's been the case from the very start. Um, you know, Harvey Cushing first saw Minnie G in 1910, and uh, he published his monograph on uh, Cushing's, and he suspected that she probably had a pituitary tumor, although he called it the polyglandular syndrome because they didn't realize where it was coming from. But in 1932, he published a series of 16 patients, uh, all of whom had been diagnosed at autopsy with small little basophilic tumors in their pituitary gland. Uh, they were diagnosed at autopsy because the only way they had to detect them back then was a skull x-ray, and they were so small, unlike any of the other types of pituitary tumors, that it, it wasn't evident where, where they were coming from. Well, in 19, so he says uh, these basophilic adenomas are the cause of this syndrome. But uh, a year after that, uh, Dr. Sussman in England uh, published a study of autopsies of 200 patients who died of other causes and found that about 20% of them had little incidental pituitary adenomas, many of which were basophilic adenomas. In the next year, Dr. Costello at the Mayo Clinic uh, published a series of 1,000 autopsies in patients who died of other reasons and also found about a 20% incidence of um, pituitary adenomas, many of which were basophilic adenomas. So uh, after that, people said, well, Cushing just found uh, incidental tumors in these patients. It had nothing to do with the syndrome. And so for 30 years, uh, the focus was on the adrenal gland. And the first surgery that was uh, done with a selective adenomectomy was done in 1963, over 50 years after Cushing had seen his first patient, and over uh, 30 years after Cushing had uh, published his series uh, that we now call Cushing's disease. So the problem has been one that's been difficult to diagnose uh, from the very beginning. Now we have, uh, we have in patients who have had uh, unsuccessful initial treatment of their Cushing's disease, we have several options. Uh, one of them uh, that we initially consider is surgery, and there are good reasons for this. Uh, but one of the first steps we take in a patient who's had unsuccessful surgery is to step back and say, let's review all the endocrine testing to make certain that the patient really does have a pituitary source of their problem. And so the first uh, uh, question we ask is, has there, are we certain of the diagnosis? Because we certainly don't want to uh, take a patient back to surgery who's already had an unsuccessful operation if we aren't certain that the problem is in their pituitary gland. Another source of difficulty uh, with these tumors is that the tumor is too small to find. That's what creates some of the diagnostic difficulty, in fact. Um, now, the optimal treatment of any pituitary tumor, including Cushing's disease, uh, is that we can immediately and completely eliminate the tumor, uh, do so selectively so that we can preserve pituitary function, and avoid complications. And the only treatment that will provide that is, is surgery. These other treatments are effective, but the only treatment that will immediately and uh, potentially eliminate the tumor uh, is that of additional surgery uh, for patients who failed or, or have persistent, uh, recurrent or persistent Cushing's disease. And so that's one of the first things we consider uh, one of the things that you that we need to give some thought to is that, you know, most uh, pituitary tumors are large tumors and aren't very uh, subtle on a pituitary MRI scan. 
if you keep in mind that most pituitary surgery in this country is done by surgeons who do only four or five a year, and uh, Cushing's is only 5% five, 5 or less of the total population of pituitary tumors, and it's a very small tumor, unlike these very large tumors that, that most surgery is done for, it's a different uh, circumstance entirely. And uh, unlike that scan I just showed you, uh, this is not an uncommon scan that we see today, a patient with a normal MRI that we have to search within the gland to find the tumor at surgery. There are certain reasons that, uh, that come up uh, fairly frequently with patients who've had uh, unsuccessful initial surgery. Um, and uh, Nelson mentioned uh, some of them. Uh, surgeons who aren't very experienced will often make a small opening in the cella so that there's still a lot of exposure of the pituitary the gland uh, that might hide a small tumor that can be found at surgery. Uh, occasionally we see surgery that's done just on one side of the septum in the sphenoid sinus so that the whole pituitary has not been exposed and explored before. Now the techniques for, for patients who have these problems are the same as they are in patients who've not had a prior operation because we're initially doing a, a fresh exposure exploration of most of the pituitary gland. Now, uh, one of the things that, that is very important in considering additional surgery is how likely is it to provide a successful operation. And if a patient has had a surgery by a surgeon who doesn't do much of the surgery, uh, these opportunities uh, show up with some frequency. Uh, so. It depends to a great extent on who did the initial exploration. I'm not going to explore a patient uh, that Nelson has thoroughly explored and not been able to find a tumor with any expectation of success. So one of the things that we uh, might expect uh, with certain techniques that, that we can use for these tumors is that uh, consistent and complete removal of the tumor. Now, you know, I should tell you that for about 25 years, about 95% of the pituitary surgery that I did was for Cushing's disease. And uh, dealing with these very small tumors, which are very un unlike those, the common uh, practice of dealing uh, with a surgical practice of very large tumors, like that tumor I showed you, was that I gradually was working alone there at the NIH and evolved uh, my own techniques that, that were based on the attempts to find and remove very small tumors. And, and they were very different than the techniques that are commonly used to, to remove pituitary tumors. And we know that these tumors originate from a single cell, and as they grow, they compress the normal glands surrounding them. And so if we take a tumor uh, that shows up like this on an MRI scan out, uh, this is what the, uh, the, the tumor's here on the left side, that's the normal gland over there. And if we take it out by working around, as that tumor grows, it compresses a little microscopic tissue envelope around the edge of the tumor. And if I use that to, to remove the tumor and then look at this tumor histologically, at the edge we can see that the whole tumor is contained within a very uh, strong microscopic package of tissue, uh, compressed reticulum. The most important step in, in uh, more surgery, helping the patient, is selection of the patient. And that begins before the surgery is undertaken. So we will need to have a well-defined objective. And that occurs in patients who have a residual tumor that's evident on the MRI scan. Uh, in, incomplete exploration of the whole gland for reasons I've described to you. If a tumor was found at the initial surgery, it's going to be at the same site uh, at a second operation. The chances of success are very low if the entire gland has been explored before by an experienced surgeon and we can't see a residual on the MRI. So if I take everybody that's had failed surgery before back to surgery, the chances of me helping most of those patients is extremely low. But if I select the patients that uh, carefully that might benefit from it, then most of them are very likely to, to have some benefit from it. So these are the circumstances that we generally used, used to uh, 
select many of these patients who might benefit from additional surgery. Now this, uh, uh, these are identical twins. Uh, their mother took their photograph on their birthday every year and they uh, look pretty much the same until they're about 11 years old. And this one's starting to develop a, some, a slightly full face and she's slightly shorter than her identical twin. Well, she stopped growing and she, uh, she started gaining weight. She stopped growing and she had another, an operation that had not been successful. By the time she uh, came to us, she was 14 inches shorter uh, than her identical twin. Um, but she still had a visible lesion on her MRI scan. And at surgery, it was one of these well-defined encapsulated, encapsulated little tumors that we could remove. And she had a very nice response to the surgery and had complete resolution of it. But she paid a price. She, she had a little bit of a catch-up growth, but she's about a foot shorter than her twin uh, today. That's many years later. Um, so she paid a big price for the delay in diagnosis of this and successful treatment of it. What about patients in whom a, uh, a tumor has been found at the initial surgery? Well, a few years ago, we did a study, and we said, well, in patients in whom I've done repeat surgery and found a tumor, so I can uh, possibly understand why that initial surgery failed, uh, let's take those patients and, and see what we found at surgery. And we had 68 such patients. Uh, 43 of them had an ACTH positive tumor that was removed at the initial operation. In 25, no tumor had been found. And in, in those patients who had a, a tumor at the initial surgery, it was at exactly the same site at repeat expiration, uh, giving us some uh, confidence that if we know where the tumor was at the initial operation, we can look at that spot uh, with a second operation. But the most common source of the failed initial surgery was dural invasion. That occurred in 62% in, uh, of the patients uh, at the uh, second operation. And in none of them was it obvious uh, on the MRI. It had to be detected at surgery. So we learned from that that uh, recurrent and persistent Cushing's disease consistently results from residual tumor, not a new tumor formation at some other site and that unappreciated dural invasion that had not been noticed at the initial surgery uh, was the basis of that persistence or recurrence. So let's look at invasion for a moment. It's the most common uh, source of failure of all pituitary surgery, in fact. We can't cure everybody that has a pituitary tumor, and the main reason is that, that uh, there's tumor out there in the cavernous sinus There's not completely removed. Uh, this patient has tumor out there around, the, although we can remove most of this tumor, we're not going to cure that tumor because of that cavernous sinus involvement. But that can happen microscopically too. These little tumors, even though they're microadenomas at the very, very lateral surface of the pituitary, very often will invade the wall of the cavernous sinus. And if we just scrape the tumor off that, the wall of that, that sinus uh, layer, we will leave microscopic tumor behind and it will come back. Uh, so not everybody that has cavernous sinus invasion is incurable by surgery because many, in fact most of these small tumors that invade the wall of the cavernous sinus only do so in a small patch of the cavernous sinus wall. If that's removed with the tumor, uh, they can still be uh, successfully treated uh, with additional surgery. But there are other, uh, not everybody that we see uh, who's had prior surgery uh, is a candidate. In fact, most patients are not candidates for an additional operation because they don't have the criteria that I listed for you there. But we have other options. In fact, most patients with Cushing's disease, uh, we can ultimately cure whether it's with surgery alone or with surgery combined with additional treatments. Now, now Adriana is going to discuss the medical therapy of failed surgery, uh, so I'm and I'm not equipped, equipped to discuss that anyway. So I'm going to leave that up to her. To her. Uh, I'm going to discuss these other options briefly. Now, that irradiation is helpful for patients with persistent uh, 
Cushing's disease after unsuccessful surgery has been evident for many years. And in, in this paper, uh, in, uh, about 20 years ago, Dr. Estrada and his colleagues showed a very nice outcome from uh, old-time fractionated radiation therapy for persistent Cushing's disease. In fact, in patients that they followed for 60 months, most of them were in remission by that time. But this is five years later. Um, Dr. Uh, Leffler and his colleague uh, recently uh, reviewed the outcome of uh, radiation therapy for pituitary tumors, and their analysis suggested that patients who have fractionated radiation uh, have an outcome that's very similar to those who have uh, radiosurgery. The problem is that this takes about five weeks to, to get, and this takes uh, one day. And the, as far as we can tell, the outcome of those different forms of irradiation are about the same. It's just that this uh, is less burdensome for the patient to get, and the response generally happens uh, uh, somewhat faster. Uh, in this review that Dr. Vance and Jason Sheehan, uh, Bobby Stark and Brian Williams, uh, two of our residents did, uh, reached uh, generally the same conclusions, that the outcome of the radiation therapy is about the same as with radiosurgery, but most patients today would much prefer to have this because it can be done in one day. Uh, bilateral adrenalectomy is also uh, an option in patients who who have not responded to surgery. Um, in this series uh, from France, uh, a little over 50 percent of the patients developed uh, progressive tumor growth after having bilateral adrenalectomy. These are patients who had not had um, irradiation of the pituitary. And that's a fairly high and concerning uh, percentage. Now, the, the percentage of patients who get this varies a lot from series to series. Many centers here in the United States uh, have not had this experience and uh, think that the next step after unsuccessful surgery is adrenalectomy. I don't think, I think most centers don't go with that, but, but some do, and some of them very experienced centers. Uh, in this paper, uh, Dr. Vance and uh, Jason Sheehan with Gotham Meda. Uh, showed, looked at the incidence of that in patients who had had uh, gamma knife of their pituitary before they got the adrenalectomy, and the incidence was uh, very low. I think it was only 5% uh, got Nelson syndrome after having their pituitary radiated. So one, and this, uh, it's not been quite this successful in some series, but, but in just about every series, uh, it's been shown that you can reduce the likelihood of developing progressive growth of a pituitary tumor after adrenalectomy by radiating the pituitary, uh, whether it's gamma knife or conventional radiation. The, the, uh, for, for gamma knife therapy, um, the incidence of Nelson syndrome after adrenalectomy, uh, the favorable, favorable aspects of fractionated radiation therapy. Um, the results of those things vary a lot from series to series and from center to center. And one has to read those studies with great care because the criteria for, for remission uh, varies and then many of the papers, uh, the way the treatment was delivered. Some, patient, some series uh, include patients who are on medical therapy uh, as success if the patients had a gamma knife or fractionated radiation, others don't. So you have to, you have to discuss with your physician uh, the nuances of which of these therapies might be uh, best for you if you have not had uh, successful surgery. So I'm left a few minutes here for questions if you want. Um, that's all I had to say about okay. more treatment for patients with persistent disease. Yes? I was actually wondering, when you were saying that fractionated irradiation is less aggravating but less effective, could you do that? And if it was not effective, move on to radiosurgery? Um, actually, 
Uh, maybe I misstate. I'll re let me repeat the question. Um, if you've had uh, r radio surgery, can you then have fractionated therapy or vice versa? Um, I, you know, I, maybe I wasn't very clear. If you look at the published series of fractionated irradiation for Cushing's disease after failed surgery, um, the results are actually slightly better than, than Gamma Knife, um, but not enough to be certain about it. And, and not many people want fractionated therapy today anyway. Uh, but yes, uh, what you can't, so if you have uh, fractionated therapy and then radio surgery, or radio surgery and then gamma knife, or, uh, uh, and then uh, fractionated therapy, the, the risk of complications is still pretty low. But you can't, if you have two radio surgery treatments, you start getting into some serious risk of, of complications, and they can be lasting and, and troublesome. Yes? Um, you know, one of the things, yes, uh, what, about, what about hyperplasia? Um, you know, um, let me talk about briefly about hyperplasia before I talk about the treatment of it. Um, you know, if we, if we do successful treatment, we expect the patient's cortisol value to drop to extremely low levels the next day or so. But the half-life of cortisol in the peripheral blood is only about 60 minutes, and the half-life of ACTH is only 12 or 15 minutes. So why does it take 24 hours for that level to drop? If you stain the normal gland, if I remove a pituitary adenoma and I remove a little, you know, the normal gland next to it, that normal gland has normal ACTH staining in the corticotrophs. It might, it's probably that leaching out of those cells that produces a delay in the drop of, of hype in the uh, nadir of hypocortisolism after the surgery. But many people who don't treat Cushing's very often, the pathologist will look at that and, he'll, and he or she will see that normal staining of the corticotros and call it hyperplasia when it's actually a, uh, it's the normal gland. Out of 1,400 or so operations for Cushing's disease, I have not seen one case of hyperplasia. So I don't, I don't know that I would be, I would question, I would have to look back at the, at the details to know. Hi, I, I've had, um, right here, huh? I've had two failed surgeries and I've also had the proton beam, okay? It, I've had the proton beam five years ago, it's not working, all right? Is that, it counted into your information by chance? Uh, yes. I, you know, um, proton beam is actually a very specialized uh, uh, form of focused irradiation, as you know. Uh, the, the, if they treated your entire pituitary and the, and the area adjacent to it, uh, there's no reason why you couldn't expect to have remission of, with an adrenalectomy and, and, and have a very low risk of developing a, a Nelson syndrome. Well, the deal is that um, I go to Mass General mm -hmm. I'm from the Boston area, and they're telling me, and I'm, I am an unusual case, that um, this proton beam was supposed to work two years ago, all right, within two years. Now it's five. Now they're telling me ten. And uh, you're laughing. <laughs> and I am getting somewhat concerned because I still have cushions. I, I don't know that there, that there are many data about the likelihood of you responding after five years if you've not already responded. I don't know how much confidence. I don't think anybody has the information to know how much confidence to put in that or not. Have you come across with any people uh, with the proton beam that it didn't work? All these, uh, uh, you know, radiobiology is radiobiology. 
it probably doesn't matter which one of these approaches you have. It's probably going to ultimately have the same chance of producing an effect. Um, it just seems to happen a little faster in patients who have gamma knife or proton beam. Thank you.